I'm really delighted to introduce to you today uh, Carrie Preston, who is an associate professor in the English department. She's a Rutgers PhD and studies modernist literature, dance and performance, feminist and queer theory, as well as transnational and post-colonial studies. It's a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear her talk today about the Japanese theatrical form called No. And uh, with that, take it away, Carrie. Yoroshika anagaishimasu which means, in Japanese, a formal phrase of greeting. It's spoken before every no performance and also before any lesson on your knees. If I was actually in a lesson, I'd stay there a lot longer, um, like a half hour to an hour, um, which was extremely painful for me. The Japanese no theater, that's N-O-H, um, but you can imagine all the jokes. There's no theater in Japan. There's no theater like no theater, all of that. Um, <laughs> I went to Tokyo uh, to take lessons in this Japanese form. And on my first day, I bowed before this man, Furukawa Mitsuro Sensei. He didn't look like this, actually. He was in practice attire, but it was disconcerting enough. Um, before entering his space for the no lesson, I had to bow on my knees, say Yoroshika Anagaishimasu, which in that circumstance means something like, please take care of me. So it's kind of a strange thing to say. I had to accept a cup of green tea while still in that kneeling position, all before the lesson started. Um, and then when we actually started the lesson, still kneeling, I would chant a phrase replicating exactly what he said. So he would say, Azuma sobi no. And lower than that, because I can't quite hit this. I was a soprano in high school. Um, so then I would say, Azuma sobi no. And I would try to replicate exactly the way he said the phrase. Um, now, that position in Seiza, knees on buns, was incredibly uh, difficult for me to perform. That was the hardest part. I didn't mind the singing so much. The movement ended up being very easy. But learning to kneel was tough. And so that's why I've decided to title my book about this experience, Learning to Kneel. Um, the experience also made me question a lot of my assumptions about good teaching and the ways we learn. And that's what I want to talk about in the RET talk today, good teaching and learning. It's a really important topic today and for us at BU when we regularly hear about the crisis in higher education and how elite universities are producing excellent sheep, as William Dershowitz famously titled his book about the miseducation of the American elite and the way to a meaningful life. He's speaking right now, competing with me at Harvard. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> How dare he? Uh, but my lessons in, in No gave me a new perspective on all of this that I'd like to share. As a professor and now the director of BU's Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program, I assumed that dropping to my knees in front of my teacher would be humiliating. These rituals emphasizing the student's submission to the authority of the teacher might even be degrading, specifically for me as a woman in the context of the ongoing marginalization of women in relation to the no theater. Women were not allowed to perform no until after World War II. Controversy was ignited in 1993 when they performed the two most sacred plays in the repertory. And only in 2004 were, were a couple of women accepted into no's professional institution, the Nihon no Gaku Kai. I faced a situation in which my rejection of exclusion based on gender was in tension with my respect for artistic tradition and cultural difference. Add my absolutely necessary humility as an American woman hoping to learn an ancient Japanese art form that many, including my teacher, considered sacred. And here's a clip that you can see um, of a no performance. This was the first dance I learned, in fact, a dance from Hagoromo. The no theater dates to the 13th century, religious rituals at shrines in Japan, and is handed down from teacher to student so that roughly the same plays have been performed in some cases since the 15th century. 
So Furukawa Sensei was teaching me the gestures that his teacher had taught him, that his teacher had taught him, and all traced back to a somewhat invented lineage, um, 600 years of history. That for me is a lot of tradition and custom, along with centuries of misogyny and support for violent politics, including the hyper-masculine samurai culture for which the no theater was the official elite theater of the ruling class. So what do I do before all of that? I kneel. Contrary to my expectations, my no lessons, go ahead and switch this slide, just go forward. My no lessons didn't feel degrading or misogynistic. The bowing and coded ways of speaking actually invited me into the special quality of the no lesson, its distance from normal life, and the way it inculcated a devotion to authority, tradition, and beauty. The no lesson is actually more important than the performance, my teacher explained to me. It's not that the lesson is the foundation for the performance in the way that I, for example, took ballet lessons so that I could perform more turns in a row. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. It wasn't like that. Um, it wasn't about getting in shape. You don't grow big muscles by kneeling on the floor. You don't master ever more challenging steps. In fact, I was introduced to the majority of the relatively simple and limited number of steps in no choreography in the very first dance I learned from the very simplest play, and you saw a little bit of it there. The most important step is the walking step, which looks like this. This step is so important to know that no has been called the art of walking. And that step is called the suryashi sliding step, which if you could see my feet, um, they slide along the floor. Um, I think no should be called the art of kneeling very painfully. But both walking and kneeling as the crucial and deceptively simple elements in no choreography, choreography indicate that teaching and learning are approached differently in no than what I was used to. There is no virtuosity to master here, no turns, no complicated leaps. In fact, the struggle is to continually withdraw any personal stylization or flair and bring the performance to its simplest form. The commonly quoted rule of no performance is, what is felt in the heart is 10, what is expressed in movement is seven. My training in Western ballet and modern dance encouraged me to add my individual character and flair and style to every movement. If I lifted my fan, I wanted to have a little head gesture along with it, which was totally not accurate to know. In fact, my, my sensei in his most relaxed moment made fun of me moving my head back and forth as I, as I moved my hand. So, withdraw, contain, reserve. Submit to the authority of the teacher and the canon of ancient plays. Attempt to perform every gesture just as they are performed by your teacher and have been performed by, by a long line of teachers for centuries. And then, only after doing the same thing, lots of kneeling and slow walking for 50 years, are you considered an, a master or an expert. Actors perform right up until their deaths and are respected more and more each year as their fan begins to shake and they are no longer able to raise themselves from that Seiza kneeling position that I found so uncomfortable. I've seen an honored no performer who couldn't get up from the kneeling position um, have two students help raise him before he performed one of the dances that was considered the one of the most difficult in the repertory. Compare this to our ballerinas who are old at 25 even film actors are past their prime at 40, for sure. Unless, of course, you're Sean Connery at 69, who can have Catherine Zeta-Jones at 30 in the film Entrapment, or <laughs> Liam Neeson at 61 with 29-year-old Olivia Wilde in third person. But that's another gender matter that I'll take up in another ret talk, maybe. The no theater doesn't feature pairs of living lovers. One or both lovers are usually dead and no. But it also doesn't celebrate youthful virtuosity the sexiness of the actor, or his or her individual style. Instead, it is about a lifelong commitment to mastering an aesthetic form, submission to authority and tradition, imitating your teacher until it no longer feels like imitation, but certainly doesn't feel natural to you either, suffering in the kneeling position, and all of the work these activities do on you as a person. Now, this probably doesn't sound like a lot of fun, 
I don't imagine you're out there saying, sign me up for no lessons. Let me sit for long periods of time in great pain. I think most of us value individuality and personal flair. Be yourself, we say. Never follow the crowd. We celebrate innovation and the new and tend to believe that discomfort is a bad thing unless it involves building bigger muscles. Kneeling doesn't build up your thighs. In the art world, we tend to presume that the more unique the interpretation, the better. And in the classroom, we think that democratic approaches to teaching are preferable so that the professor should work to downplay her authority and to empower students. She should try to make her students as comfortable as possible. These are all values I've held as a teacher here at BU. And I don't intend to entirely abandon them. But my no studies suggested that those are culturally specific ways of approaching teaching and learning and not always the best in every circumstance. In fact, they may actually conceal the very real power dynamics at work in a college classroom. There is, for example, the fact of grades. Teachers and students are not primarily friends and maybe better learning would happen if we didn't so often organize the classroom atmosphere as if they were. Here at an American university, we seem to assume that informal relationships are more genuine or authentic. Formality is forced, superficial, and act. In my no lessons, power differentials were explicitly recognized and marked in the ways individuals spoke and behaved toward each other. Formality was considered an honest recognition of power. It was also part of general civility and politeness. An informal relationship isn't always less authentic than a formal one. In fact, it's more of an act if informality conceals the real power dynamics at work. So I believe we've gone a bit too far with our casual classrooms. And I think it contributes something to the crisis in higher education. I'm flashing some, some news about that here. Professors are experts in their fields, just as my sensei was a master performer. And I don't think students always learn better when their teachers undermine their authority. Learning is hard, even terrifying. When I had to learn Japanese, I cowered lest the teacher, I was in an undergraduate class here at BU, lest the teacher call me to the board to draw kanji, which I was terrible at. Um, it's terrifying. A confident expert teacher and guide can be helpful. Learning involves a certain amount of drudgery and discomfort. And if something is really worth knowing, we are right to devote years to its mastery. In our push for the new and innovative, we tend to push aside the collective knowledge represented by tradition and ancient art forms. I am sympathetic to, mu to what much of William Dershowitz says. That's what he looks like over there at Harvard. <laughs> I'm sympathetic to what he says about how elite educations are producing excellent sheep who, after tallying all the right extracurriculars and taking their SAT prep courses, get into great universities, continue to make themselves ridiculously busy and stressed out, do so much that they forget about being where they are at any given point in time, and achieve hyper miseducations. I spent my college years doing just that. But taking no lessons slowed me down made me think of the value of being still, painfully still, on my knees. And maybe that pain kept me aware of where I was. But Dershowitz also emphasizes becoming an individual, a unique being, as he says in his book. And he also suggests that if you don't become one by the time you leave college, you never will. And I'm not so sure about that. I think you should be becoming the person you want to be for your entire life. You're not finished when you graduate college at 22, unless your aspiration is a career in ballet. I also think we need to focus less on uniqueness. Different isn't good in and of itself, in spite of the fast food slogan. In fact, the slogan should be evidence that difference can also be used to sell the same old stuff. No taught me that powerful self-work is often slow, not fast, and comes from kneeling, enduring, and submitting to old traditions with all of their complications. And I'm thinking about the misogyny I spoke of at the beginning of this talk. Now, as tempting as it might be to ask all students to come and kneel in front of me when they enter my classroom, that's not what I'm really into. It is kind of tempting, though. I'd like us to shift our perspective on teaching and learning, and we might want to see what the classroom looks like from our knees. Thank you.
Hi, so you're a professor of gender studies. How did you get there from doing theater and uh, performance? Is that? That's a great question. Um, I actually moved from gender studies to thinking about the no theater. I was always doing some of both at the same time. Um, but there's some really interesting complications. Um, I'm, I'm writing this book about queer pedagogies and, and the strange erotic experiences within the lesson as well. I didn't focus on that part in the talk. But the gender studies is still very much present for me in this project as well. Thanks. Are you going to continue? To study no? Are you going to continue to study no as um, you go forward? For 50 years? For 50 years. I never would have imagined. This was a totally instrumental thing. Um, and in the process of learning Japanese, enough Japanese, which I did, as I said, here in undergraduate classrooms, um, trying to fit in as an undergrad, not doing a very good job, partially because I was so bad and the students were so good. Um, but in the process of learning Japanese um, and spending time in Tokyo, living in Tokyo, and, and beginning from the position of hating this art form and then submitting to it, and, and literally I think of it the way if you're kneeling in that position long enough, you sort of feel the tendons of your knees change and shift and try to make you a little more comfortable. Um, I think of it that way, is that once that's happened, you sort of can't go back. Your, your muscles, your tendons have been stretched and, and changed forever. So yes, no is a part of my life now. I have been playing with writing a little bit of no plays, and, and I still perform mostly kind of fusion work, so using the no performance technique with more modern performance. I'm sure everyone would love to come kneel in front of me and say, Yoroshika nagaishimasu, and spend that time kneeling. Yes, I'd love to. Um, you talked about how no is very traditional and um, very, very ancient. Are there more, any real contemporary works of no right now? Are there still um, like new no performances being written? I guess, are they even written? Or are they more yeah. just created and then taught? That's a great question, too. Um, so when you go to a no performance, if, if they have something in English, you're often handed a program in English that says the no theater hasn't changed since the 15th century which is, of course, totally false. Um, but, but it was some of the, the, the channels by which no changed were in part their movement and, and the, uh, the torturous deformation of those forms as they moved into Europe and, and the US in the early 20th century. So that's part of what I'm tracing. So a poet named W.B. Yeats, Irish poet, um, got very interested in no and tried to create some of his own no plays, which then, in a really interesting circuit, and he knew almost nothing about no. Um, he was using translations by another poet, Ezra Pound, who didn't speak Japanese and yet was translating these plays. So really complicated. Um, but then those plays he created ended up traveling back to Japan after World War II and they, they helped to encourage new innovation in the no theater um, and innovation is a really complicated word <laughs> in relation to the no theater uh, but there are now more and more new no plays being created it's still um, it's still controversial but um, that movement of no out of Japan and then back to Japan in, in sometimes strangled, twisted forms actually encouraged some of that, that experimentation with the form. And it's now being used in fusion theater as well, which we wouldn't call sort of strictly no, um, but the techniques. And, and you can see the techniques in Japanese film, too, um, where those performance techniques in, in a filmmaker like Akira Kurosawa 